Almost everything that matters is difficult, and everything matters. I come before you to remind you of your childhood. No, not of yours, but rather of all that ever was childhood. For it should be possible to awaken memories that are not yours, memories older than you. I shall seek to restore connections and renew relationships that came about long before you. His smile was soft and fine, like gleaming on old ivory, like homesickness, like a Christmas snowfall in the dark village, like turquoise around which many pearls are fashioned, like moonlight on a favorite book. Hey everybody, thank you as always for watching Leaf by Leaf. Today I am going to talk about Reiner Maria Rilke. Specifically, we're going to read from his Letters to a Young Poet. We're going to read from his earlier book of poetry called The Book of Images. And we're going to take a look at this beautiful book from Archipelago that includes William H. Gass's stunning essay on Rilke on Rodin, and also the monograph that Rilke was commissioned to do on Rodin, and a talk that he gave later on. It's astonishing that with Rilke, we can look at letters, prose, and poetry, and see the sublime and the mesmerizing craft he was able to achieve in each of those different media. Rilke is one of those artists who is so infinite and so timeless and so sublime that he will live on forever. Vita brevis ars longa, never truer with Rilke. I myself first fell in love with Rilke's poetry from the selected works that I got when I was in Sweden. I think I talked about it in my uh, poetry bookshelf tour, but I got a selected works from a bookshop there in uh, Gothenburg, Sweden, and I, I was just completely in its thrall. And many of those poems have never left me, have never diminished their grip on me. Rilke represents the radical summit of romanticism uh, in terms of the artistic movement and impulses of romanticism. He also represents that once in a generation artist who is completely given over to their work and their purpose and their craft. Rilke is that artist who so believes in his vocation that he gave up everything else. He sacrificed everything for his art. Eventually, this would leave him in a life of complete self-exile, self-imposed isolation. Unfortunately, the ramifications are clear and very sordid because this ousted a wife and a young child, a young daughter named Ruth. And it just goes to show that for every freedom we reach for and attain, there is going to be a sacrifice. Someone else's freedom is likely to get encumbered because of our own. Thankfully, we have not only Rilke's letters to the young poet, but we have the young poet's letters back to him. This is the first ever English publication of both sets of letters translated by Damien Searles, and this is put out by Live right or Liverite. I'm not really sure how you pronounce this publisher's name, but it, it's composed of the two words live and write. So live right, live right. I don't know. Anyhow, I will say that without the other side of this correspondence, which is how we have known the letters to a young poet for generations now, there's something even more enigmatic and timeless and sublime when you just have Rilke's side of it. It's sort of uh, devoid of its immediate particular application. Nonetheless, we now have a more uh, filled out conversation between the two that we get to observe. It uh, lends itself to a, a more wide ranging application and relevance, just as the introduction to this volume makes clear the letters to a young poet have inspired people like Madonna and Lady Gaga and Dustin Hoffman. In the letters, we get Rilke. Everything we will come to know his poetry for is there in the letters. Being alone, silence, solitude, isolation, inwardness, interiority, self-sufficiency, the importance of memory, the 
Eden of childhood that we need to strive to resurrect in our present. The inexplicable, the spiritual depths and sensation and feeling. Rilke is no doubt one of the most sensitive poets who has ever lived. And what's insane is that he wrote the first letter when he was 27 years old. Right off the bat in this letter, he says, most of what happens is unsayable, unfolding in a space no word has ever entered. And the most unsayable of all are the works of art, those mysterious creatures whose life endures alongside our own, which is so fleeting. The first letter also contains one of the quotes that he is most famous for, and that is when he said, no one can help you or give you advice. No one. The only thing to do is go into yourself. Look for the reason that is making you right. See whether it has put down roots in the deepest place in your heart. Admit in all honesty whether or not you would die if you weren't allowed to write. This put me in the mind of Cyril Connolly in his word cycle, The Unquiet Grave, where right off the bat he says, uh, the more books we read, the more apparent it is that the task of a writer is to produce a masterpiece. What both Rilke and Connolly are getting at is that we don't just produce output or produce poems because we are a poet or produce books because we are a writer, but we strive out of a, a deep and fatal need to create and we reach beyond what has been done, what is being done into the eternal and connect that with something deep, deep inside of us that for Rilke was represented in the things that we held so dear in childhood. Those things will become sort of uh, gateways or, or portals into this eternal art for which we sacrifice everything else in life. Pretty hard hitting stuff, especially for a young writer or a young poet, a young sculptor, or a young actor or what have you. Nonetheless, these letters continue to be an inspiration for artists and non-artists alike. He tells us that of all the books I've read, very few are indispensable. And in fact, there are two that I always have with me, the Bible and the works of the great Danish writer, Jens Peter Jakobsen. He tells the young poet, live in these books for a while. Learn from them whatever you feel is worth learning, but above all, love them. This love will be repaid to you thousands and thousands of times over. In whatever direction your life may take, I am certain that this love will run through the fabric of your development as one of the most important threads among all the threads of your experiences, disappointments, and joys. I love that advice on how to approach the great books, the meaningful books. He says, live in these books for a while. In other words, don't just try to get through them. Learn from them and whatever you feel is worth learning. That means chase down the things that speak to you. But above all, love them. Especially when we're younger and we're grappling with those questions that come about when we begin maturing and pressing into adulthood. This is beautiful advice. Have patience about everything that is still unresolved in your heart. Try to love the questions themselves like locked rooms, like books written in a truly foreign language. Don't look for the answers now. They cannot be given to you yet because you cannot live them yet. And what matters is to live everything. For now, live the questions. Don't fear the inexplicable. Don't fear the spiritual realm. This fear of the inexplicable has done more than impoverished the life of the individual. Only someone who is ready for anything, excluding nothing, not even the most puzzling or mysterious thing can have a vital living relationship with someone else and can draw from sources within himself for his own existence. Even though Rilke put so much emphasis on withdrawing into the self, the way that he says Rodin's thinker is curling into himself, you don't totally reject others in your life. In fact, he says, be good to those who remain behind you, meaning when you leave, leave them behind to go into your self uh, impose exile. Be calm and self-assured before them. Don't punish them with your doubts or frighten them with your confidence and joy they cannot understand. Try to have some kind of simple, loyal, common ground with them that doesn't necessarily have to change when you yourself change again and again. But of course, he goes on to say, don't ask them for advice. Don't expect any understanding. And a lot of this emphasis on pushing aside the world around you and 
delving as deeply as possible into your artistic calling comes from the massive influence of Rodin on the young Rilke. In fact, Rilke would get commissioned to go and write a monograph on Rodin and live there in his studio in France and basically become a street urchin on, on the streets of Paris and sort of live through this squalor, all the time having a wife and a child distant from him. Eventually, his wife would move and be there with him, but their daughter would have to stay behind with her grandmother. Nonetheless, it was Rodin that really shaped the Rilke that we know now. He watched Rodin, who spent many, many years unknown and in squalor tried to break into the art world, he was rejected, and then in his old age, he would become known as this sublime sculptor that we know today. Rodin was very much about travailler, travailler, il faut travailler, work, 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 and patience, patience et travailler. He was all about patience, patience, and work, work, work. In the monograph that Rilke would do on Rodin, for me, it stands with Walter Pater on the Renaissance. It stands with John Ruskin in Sesame and Lilies. It stands with Kandinsky in Concerning the Spiritual in Art as thoughts on sculpture and art and on Rodin. His ability to take a sculpture and Michael Eastman's gorgeous photos of Rodin sculptures are also included in here. But what's amazing is Rilke's ability to speak about this one object and the movement in it, the light, the contour, the different perspectives. I was blown away because I, I look at something like that and I haven't read a lot of art like that, but I look at something like that and I may be able to muster up a paragraph or two about it, but Rilke can go on and on and just open up these perspectives on a sculpture that would otherwise remain closed to people like me. The prose that he writes is remarkable, just as remarkable as his poems. For example, he says, that man with the broken nose, unforgettable as a suddenly raised fist. That young man who stretches up an emotion as familiar as your own awakening. That walker, upright like a new word for walking in the vocabulary of your feeling. Oh, that's beautiful. And the one who sits, thinking with his whole body, withdrawing into himself, and the burger with the key like a great repository of pure pain. And Eve bent into her own embrace as if from a great distance, her hands turning outward to reject everything, including her own changing body. And the sweet, soft inner voice, armless like life within and separated from the rhythm of the group and some small thing whose name you have forgotten, made from a shimmering white embrace that holds together like a knot, and the other that may be called Paolo and Francesca, and still smaller ones you find within yourself like fruits with very thin skin. The Book of Images doesn't get talked about a whole lot, especially in light of his later sublime work, The Duino Elegies and The Sonnets to Orpheus. I recently reread The Duino Elegies and The Sonnets to Orpheus because of their relevance to Thomas Pynchon's Gravity's Rainbow, and I was again reminded why this is the apex of his career. It's made all the more astonishing because, for example, at one point, Rilke got to go to Russia and visit with the great, enormous monument of writing that is Count Leo Tolstoy. And Tolstoy told him directly, writing poetry is utterly useless. And yeah, it sent Rilke into a little bit of a tailspin, but he persisted even through that. The Book of Images has three parts to my mind, even though it's actually, it's technically divided in a different way, but there's the first part, and the third part, which I think are the best. The middle sort of bogs down and it shows a younger poet feeling his way through different forms, different modes, but we're already seeing an explosive poet. The prevailing mood is of course the pensive or the melancholy, but this only intensifies the conflagrations of vigor. Out of infinite desires rise finite deeds like weak fountains that fall back in early trembling arcs. But those which otherwise in us keep hidden are happy strengths. They come forth in these dancing tears. Oh, how much truer are the animals that pace up and down in steel grids, unrelated to the antics of the new alien things which they don't understand. And they burn like a silent fire, 
softly out and subside into themselves, indifferent to the new adventure and with their fierce instincts all alone. I would like to step out of my heart's door and be under the great sky. I would like to pray, and surely one of all those stars must still exist. Rilke meditates a lot on silence, and this corresponds directly with the title he chose, the Book of Images. Images are still, they are silent. And in this silence, Rilke found his vocational muse. You want to scream in the silence. They burn like a silent fire. Speaking of the inexplicable and the spiritual, especially the angelic, we get these beautiful passages. Only when they spread their wings are they wakers of a wind, as if God with his broad sculptor hands leafed through the pages in the dark book of the beginning from the guardian angel. You, who talk of miracles as of common knowledge and of men and of women as of melodies and of roses, of events that in your eyes blazingly take place, you blessed one, when will you at last name him from whose seventh and last day shards of glory can still be found on the beating of your wings? Do I need to ask? What, an, what a powerful image. The shards of God's glory can still be found on the beating of this guardian angel's wings. Here's the poem Memory. And you wait, await the one thing that will infinitely increase your life the gigantic, the stupendous, the awakening of stones, depths turned round toward you. The volumes in brown and gold flicker dimly on the bookshelves, and you think of lands traveled through, of paintings, of the garments of women found and lost. And then, all at once you know, that was it. You rise, and there stands before you the fear and prayer and shape of a vanished year. What's amazing about these three stanzas that make up this poem memory is on the first line, we get the notion of the one thing. And then in the third, the last stanza at the end of the first line, we get that was it. So during this time in between the one thing that we were waiting for, it just happened. And what was it? Well, at the very end of the whole poem, we get it, a vanished year. So to me, time in this poem becomes memory so quickly that the one can vanish as the other appears while we await with hope some, some unknown thing. Like John Lennon said, life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. I've read long now, since this afternoon with its rain rushing lay against the windows. I'd become oblivious to the wind outside. My book was hard. I gazed into its lines as into faces whose looks grow dark from deep reflection, and around my reading the hours built up. Suddenly, now, brightness spills upon the pages, and instead of the fearful word confusion stands, evening, evening, everywhere upon them. I keep my eyes fixed, and yet the long lines tear apart and the words roll away from their threads to wherever they will. Then I know. Over the overfull, glittering gardens the skies are vast. The sun was to have broken through once more, and now summer night sets in, as far as one can see. What's dispersed collects into a few groups, darkly on long paths. People wander, and strangely far off, as if it meant more, one hears the little that still transpires. And when now I lift my eyes from my book, nothing will seem alien, everything great.